Uh, hi everyone. Welcome to the news um, to the new season of the Theory from the Margins lecture series. My name is Patrick Brock from the Department of Culture Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo, and I'll be moderating today's session. Just a reminder: this is our last webinar of the year, and please keep an eye on our website and Facebook page for further details about our return in February. But before we move on to introduce today's speaker. I would like to say a few introductory words about who we are and what we do. The Theory from the Margins Collective deep reads on current scholarship on post-colonial theory, the decolonial turn, and theory building from the global south. The collective reads works from marginalized communities in the global north and south, as well as critical interventions based on in-depth studies of marginalized groups. Theory from the Margins is primarily interested in the contemporary global academics engagement with what we understand to be theory, and it aims to spark broader discussions about theoretical concepts outside of academia. And I'm joined today by my colleague, Dr. Merv Tabor from the Department of Cultural Studies and Oriental Languages at the University of Oslo, and by Tian Theron from the Norwegian School of Theology and Society. Without further ado, I will now leave the floor to Merv to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Patrick. Our speaker today is David Niemer. David, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, David Niemer is an assistant professor in the Department of Media Studies and in the Latin American Studies program at the University of Virginia. He's also a faculty associate at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society and a visiting scholar at the Institute for Rebuilding Social Media, both at Harvard University. Niemer is the author of Technology of the Press, which was recently released in uh, 2022 um, from MIT Press, and Favela Dig Digital, The Other Side of Technology. He holds an MS in Computer Science from Saarland University, an MA in Anthropology from the University of Virginia, and a PhD in Computing, Culture, and Society from Indiana University. Niemer has written for The Guardian, El Pais, HuffPost, Salon, The Intercept, UOL, and Carta Capital. Today, David Niemer will talk about his new book, Technology of the Oppressed, where he draws on his extensive ethnographic fieldwork in Brazil to provide an account for how favela residents engage with technology uh, in community technology centers and in their everyday lives. Um, Niemer's book, The Technology of the Oppressed, is available. It's open access, so anyone who wants to read it can download it and read it. Uh, without further ado, David, the floor is yours. Thank you for joining us today again. Thank you so much, Merv. It's such a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Thank you, Patrick and Teong, for the invitation. And again, it's, it's an honor to be here. I have a couple of uh, slides that I, I can show during the presentation. Uh, so I think I, I would do that uh, just to show some illustrations here. Uh, let me know if this works. Does this work? Yep. So you see just the slides, right? Cool. Thank you so much. So uh, what I'll do here, I'll spend, you know, 10, 15 minutes presenting the theoretical framework of this book, because it is based on this, this framework that I unpack several of the cases and stories that I came across during my ethnographic work in the favelas of Brazil. So uh, the book, Technology of the Oppressed, Inequity in the Digital Mundane in Favelas of Brazil, uh, the book itself marks the end of a 10-year cycle of this research that I started in 2012 um, during my PhD dissertation um, times. And then it was quite interesting. I mean. People ask me why it took me so long. It's not that the project itself took so long. It was just that it was a care, uh, uh, an ongoing research that because of the several events that happened in Brazil, I thought it was interesting to keep looking at the phenomena, the social phenomena that was happening in the country to see what else could inform the current uh, sites of oppression and sources of oppression that happened in Brazil. And that, you know, I talk about in the book about the June journeys I talk about the uh, Elinão, which was the sort of a Me Too movement in Brazil. I talk about the Holocenes or the little strolls of, of folks from the peripheries when they occupy spaces that were meant for white rich people. So all these you know, events helped me build a strong case 
and with more evidence that allows us to have a deep understanding of how, how, how oppression happens, uh, especially in Brazil. So uh, it's not a coincidence that the title of this book is reminiscent of Paulo Freire's Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Uh, Paulo Freire was a Brazilian educationalist and philosopher whose radical ideas about pedagogy, learning, and knowledge established the so-called critical pedagogy movement. Uh, Freire's philosophy came not only from you know, classical approaches stemming from Plato, he was also inspired by uh, existential phenomenologists like uh, Heidegger, uh, modern Marxists, like uh, and anti-colonial anti -colonial thinkers like Franz Fanon. In fact, some folks see pedagogy of the oppressed as being a, a response to Franz Fanon's Wretched of the, word, the Earth. Um, so as I bring Paulo Freire uh, in my book and, and you know, in order to frame the technology of the oppressed, I often get asked if my book is about instructional or educational technologies. And you know, I say no, because Freire himself became very dissatisfied with how his ideas were approached as a methodology. In an interview with Donaldo Macedo, which was um, uh, a collaborator, uh, a thinker, a partner uh, to Paulo Freire, he said, Paulo Freire said to Macedo, uh, I don't want to be imported or exported. It is impossible to export pedagogical practices without reinventing them. As scholars, researchers recreate and rewrite my ideas. So Freire's invitation to others to reinvent his ideas inspired me to develop a framework that seeks to understand why digital technologies can be simultaneously sites of oppression and tools that can be appropriated by the oppressed in their pursuit of freedom. I use the term mundane technology to describe this framework. So this, this framework doesn't provide a method or a set of techniques to liberate the oppressed, nor it is a pedagogical plan. Rather, I conceptualize mundane technology as an epistem. So it's a way of understanding oppression in Freire's process of becoming conscious and the information age. And the, this term becoming conscious in Portuguese as uh, as a, this is like a, a direct translation, but it's a, a word that doesn't really have a translation to other languages, which is called conscientização, or you know, to become aware, to become critically aware of a situation, and that I bring you know this uh, this understanding of becoming critical critically aware in the information age. So to understand oppression we must understand what constitutes the relationship between the oppressed and the oppressor. So it's a relational phenomenon. So according to Freire, uh, one of the fundamental elements is prescription, which you know, are guidelines, uh, guidelines that imposed the consciousness of the prescriber, who is the oppressed, upon the consciousness of the prescribed, which is the oppressed. In other words, the behavior of the oppressed is denied by the oppressor, which is a form of control that impedes the achievement of freedom. So prescription, as claimed by, by Bruno Latour, can also be imposed by non-human actants, such as technological artifacts that dictate human, uh, human action. So in the favelas, prescriptions were not only imposed through laws and boundaries, but also designed into algorithms and technological affordances of digital technologies. So when, when Paulo Freire talks about prescription, the way that he talks about it seems like he's talking about code because code and algorithms are nothing but a, a set of rules and prescriptions that defines and help shape human behavior. And when oppression is embedded in prescription, embedded in code, then we see uh, you know, sites of, of oppression like favelas being a target for these technological, um, oops, technological algorithms and technological affordances. So given an understanding that technology can mask and deepen oppression, 
The question that I raise in my book is how can favela residents use te digital technologies in their quest to liberate themselves and regain their humanity? And to address this question in the book, I bring stories of humans living in the favelas of Brazil, which is a site of oppression, who creatively and critically appropriate technologies in their journeys to find liberation. And I call this mundane technology. So I did not coin the term, the, the term mundane technology. It has actually been explored by previous scholars that are interested in understanding the role of technology in everyday life. So for example, Paul Dorish uh, referred, refers to mundane technologies as those that are commonplace, which many people use, such as smartphones, texting. In, in the book, I could talk about mm -hmm. selfies, uh, emails, uh, Excel spreadsheets, and so on. Mike Michael suggests that the term mundane technologies connotes those technologies whose novelty has worn off. So these are the technology, technologies which are now fully integrated in an un unremarkable part of everyday life. Trevor Pinch and David Edgerton have called for a move away from innovation-driven studies of technology to studies of the mundane technologies because they have become so integral to everyday use that it is often difficult to identify what is anthropologically and sociologically relevant about them. So while I borrow the notion of mundane technology in this book, I expand the term to go beyond digital artifacts, to refer to the oppressed, uh, to the oppressed process of appropriating technology every, in everyday life. So these everyday technologies, again, it's not just technological artifacts like a smartphone, but it's also an operation like infrastructure maintenance and repair, which we call uh, in the book, I bring the cases of Gambiaja and Gato, which are two terms and two processes that have been demonized by upper classes in Brazil. But in fact, if we look deeper and critically into these practices are nothing but an exercise of the oppressed uh, becoming citizens since they are fighting and finding ways to become part of the city infrastructure so they can have proper water, electricity, and so on. And also spaces, like spaces are also these mundane technologies. Like in the book, I talk about the land houses, which are kind of like a cyber cafe, and telecenters, which were govern government sponsored uh, computer labs that were appropriated by the, the favela residents that made those spaces not computer labs but rather a community center. So it was bef before anything else, it was a community center. Later on, you know, they saw that as a computer lab. So uh, by appropriating this everyday technology, again, artifacts, operations, and spaces, they use, this to, use them to alleviate oppression in their everyday lives. So mundane technologies encompass also non-productive everyday activities and desires that people engage with. So they, you know, the Monday technology constitute a decolonial framework for understanding how people exercise their agency and consciousness or conscientização and appropriate technologies to mobilize themselves toward a quality of life they desire. So in my book, I animate the stories of humans that live in the favelas of Vitória, Espírito Santo, or the state of the Holy Ghost, who creatively and critically appropriate technologies in their everyday journeys to find liberations. So before I hand it over to you guys for questions and you know Q&A, I just wanted to do a rundown of, of mm -hmm. what I actually bring in the book to unpack this framework of mundane technologies. So I started the book. Of course, there, there's the introduction. This is exactly you know, what I just presented. I also make the case that mundane technology is also an intersectional uh, framework, a decolonial and an uh, intersectional framework, because for us to understand oppression, we need to understand the difference uh, uh, sources of oppression. So it's not just because they're lower class, but it is also because they are uh, part of the mm -hmm. black and brown populations in the, in the country. There's also a, a big gender aspect that plays into oppressions in those sites, uh, as well as um, the idea of citizenship, that citizenship is often denied to those folks. Uh, and then chapter two, 
I talk about repairing the broken city. So again, repair here is a mundane technology because it's an activity that was appropriated by them to make their infrastructure work. Unfortunately, it's mm -hmm. uh, the favelas are a site of precarity. Uh, infra infrastructure breakdown is normalcy. Or in other words, it's a constant. So instead of thinking of a constant working infrastructure, we need to think that there, this normalcy never made it. And what is normalcy there means repair and maintenance of this infrastructure. So they, they can't really count on this stable infrastructure, infrastructure that oftentimes, as in more privileged spaces, can count on. Uh, and the infrastructure here, I go from large scale, like light poles, internet infrastructure, to smaller scales like smartphones and even the QWERTY keyboard. I move on to talk about the, the community technology centers as mundane technology. So the community technology centers or the CTCs are exactly what I said. It's, it's the, uh, they are the land houses and the tele centers. And they were first designed to be computer labs, but in fact, they became uh, community spaces where, for example, residents found shelter when there were shootouts happening outside. It was a safe space for uh, mothers of the favelas to leave their kids there protected because they have to work all day long and they couldn't leave their kids unattended in, in, in the streets and by themselves at home. Uh, it was a place uh, that worked as an extension to, you know, the, the residents' schools. Uh, many folks engaged in all kinds of educational and even um, were places where people find uh, employment, for example. And I move on to talk about social media. Social media played a, a, an immense role there. And it was interesting to see how they appropriated social media as their own. Certainly different uh, um, ways of using Facebook, for example, where their uh, favorite feature was Facebook chat because of privacy concerns and because of um, chat, they could really uh, um, protect their identity, protect their information, and also know the audience that was receiving the information that they were sending. Also, I talk a lot about selfies, how selfies became uh, a way to send complex message to a specific audience, but encapsulated in a more um, a banal or a more mundane message that those outside you know, the, the, the audience would not understand what was going on. So it's, it was by saying a lot, by hiding a little. Uh, and then I talk about geographies of, your, of, of oppression. Then I talk about um, what happens to the favela residents when they leave the favelas, right? So I, I bring the case of the Holesinos, uh, how you know folks from the favelas were treated in shopping malls in Brazil, which are spaces that are made and designed for the rich and whites. And as soon as they join, you can imagine that they suffer all kinds of prejudice because they were poor and black. And I also talk about the June journeys, which was uh, uh, social movements that happened back in 2013 that up to now, we're still trying to understand the legacy of these movements because it was a movement that counted on uh, you know, it was a protest against the government, but not precisely against the government, but rather the conditions of life in Brazil, you know, protests against the immense uh, cost of hosting the Olympics and, and the World Cup. So there were people that belonged to the left, to the right. It was a, a, a nonpartisan and a, and a nonpartisan approach. But unfortunately, as things moved on, the, the will of change was appropriated by those on the far right that skewed the, the sense of change to bring to their own far right agenda and, and, and desires. And this is you know how I bring it to the second to last chapter, which was technology of the oppressed, uh, sorry, the oppressor. So I do a shift set of focusing on the oppressed and focus on the oppressor and how they appropriate the technologies to oppress, to double down on, on oppressions. By bringing you know, all this, this how it, we went from 2013, who that seemed to be progressive and, and forward thinking movements, into movements that were promoting uh, military dictatorship, military coup, and and the and the comeback of the far right in Brazil and the rise of Bolsonaro. And then I also talk about my latest research project on misinformation, 
and how Bos uh, Bolsonaro's campaign, basically, and whoever was wanting to promote him, used WhatsApp to promote misinformation that got Bolsonaro elect elected. And it was what was interesting about that case is that, as we know, WhatsApp doesn't have, it's a messaging app. It does not have an algorithm and it requires human uh, action, you know, for you to receive a sent message. But in the absence of this um, algorithm, a human infrastructure of misinformation was put together that replicated a behavior of an algorithm that not only cre created, but also curated and distributed misinformation to groups all over WhatsApp. And unfortunately, promote Bolsonaro and help him getting to the office of the president. Um, the idea was to finish the book right there. But as I was you know, finishing writing the book, it was completely unfair to leave the book right there, not fair to the readers not fair to uh, favela residents, but this book was uh, supposed to be about them, right? Uh, so I went back to Paulo Freire and I, and I leave this as a tip. Every time you feel stuck, go back to your favorite um, post-colonial, decolonial scholar because they will have the answer. And that's what I did. Went back to Paulo Freire and started reading Pedagogy of Hope. So this book was mainly framed after Pedagogy of the Oppressed but then I went to Pedagogy of Hope to see what else was there that Paulo Freire could help us think in a decolonial uh, uh, way, especially in times of despair where we're losing hope. That's where I was. Uh, that's where we were, right? Not too long ago with the rise of the far right all over the, the world. And Pedagogy of Hope really helped me saw through it and beyond and how can we rethink the technology of the oppressed as the technology of hope. So I end the book with this conclusion of technology of hope and, and how can we think about, you know, the uses of technology that can bring hope instead of oppression. And, and the end of the book, I, I it's like the final paragraph. Uh, so throughout the book, I try to avoid to give uh, design uh, uh, um, suggestions because it's not about my own ways of thinking how technology should be, rather how the oppressed think that way. But in the end, I leave a suggestion and how can we think about technology that instead of uh, um, amplifying and replicating oppression can be truly about liberation. So my suggestion is that, you know, instead of having, and I even, even bring a, a, a question is, why do the oppressed have to resist? Why do they have to be resilient when it comes to using technology? Why can that technology work for them on day one, you know, why do they have to spend time and effort? You know, they have so much to worry about. Why do technology have to bring more of this concern? And they have to fight and, and, and struggle, spend time and effort to make the technology theirs. So instead of thinking this way, we should bring those the oppressed in the decision tables where design decisions are being taken, right? Where these technologies are being designed, where uh, policies are being designed, so then they can bring their own esteem, their own uh, way of living, their, their point of view, because they will be the best ones to design the technology for themselves, to design the policies for themselves, right? So only then we can start thinking of this technology that instead of promoting uh, oppression, will promote liberation and hope. So I will end here. Uh, thank you so much again for the time. And yeah, let's get this conversation going. Yeah, thank you very much, David, for a very illuminating lecture, and especially the last part on democratizing design. Um, I'm going to uh, ask Murphy to uh, ask the first question. Thanks, Patrick. Um, and thank you, David, for this wonderful talk. Um, speaking of hope, um, I was reminded toward the end of your book, you mentioned how some of the individuals that you have interviewed um, have seen you as a very, very as a very positive influence, as as kind of a source of hope, because you were always very present and you were caring, and you were attentive and you cared you cared about what's going on there. And this made me think of um, of feminist pedagogies, of feminist pedagogies and ethics of care and and attentiveness and and listening to the others. So um, I want to ask about this like intersectional element of your work. Um, in your chapter five, in the introduction to the chapter five, especially, you mentioned 
um, bell hooks and other feminists critiques of Freire's um, sexist language and the pedagogy of the oppressed. But beyond that, um, what are some ways in which you think your work converses with or converges with feminist pedagogies or practices and, and theories such as like feminist science and technology studies? And I know you mentioned that this book, like mundane technology is not really a pedagogical plan or or a methodology, but it seems like there are a lot of ways in which uh, your project converges with feminist pedagogies and practices and, and theories. So, yeah, no, thank you. That's that's a great question, and it's a big question, right? Uh, because I think this is this is the way that we should approach when dealing with uh, post-colonial and decolonial research, because we should not uh, attend or perceive informants as merely source of data and information, but rather as human beings, that whatever you write about them will somehow impact them. So when I went to the field in, in the favelas uh, and I would present myself as a researcher, uh, and I write this in my uh, positionality section in the introduction, I was, um, I mean, not surprised, but like disappointed to see how they completely distance themselves when I said, you know, I was a researcher. And that has to do because of past experiences and how like, you know, they said they were approached by researchers as if they were uh, laboratory rats, right? as if they were guinea pigs, part of an experiment. And uh, they, they've been perceived, you know, in their studies as bad people, the same way that they're perceived in, in newspapers, articles, right, unfortunately. And they never saw anything coming back to them that could benefit not only their community, but also their time and effort to be part of that research, right? Um, so the constant, as you mentioned, the constant care about making sure that they're not only being represented the way they wanted, but also to see a way that that research could benefit um, them as a community and also as a site of, of living. Um, so instead of, again, thinking about the oppressed as an entity or as a state, I, I look at op oppression as a, a, a process where they constantly engage you know, with technologies to find that sort of liberations. And I'm, I'm very careful to label how technology plays out in this liberation process, right? Because oftentimes, given technological determinism all over the world, we you know we tend to think, yeah, just dump technology and things will will get fixed, which is not true. Uh, I'll, but I'll, at the same time, I'm looking to the ways that as they use technology, we can find instances of liberation. So this is why I make mundane technologies not about the artifact the artifacts per se, but rather the process of appropriation. By, by the oppressed. And it's because we're looking into human action and understanding their agency. I think that's where I believe I, I speak to uh, feminist uh, pedagogical theories because it's about acknowledging and respecting uh, the subaltern agency. Oftentimes the subaltern uh, are seen as merely computer users or tech users. They're just producing data for the big techs to to do whatever analysis they want. But no, those are human beings that are constantly uh, exercising their agency and fighting for their place in the world. And I think by analyzing that, then we can look into the ways that they are producing knowledge, knowledge and, and, and uh, producing social norms that should be valued by academia and by research as a way of being, instead of saying that it's either an exotic way of living then that doesn't really comply with the global north standards. So people contrast, instead of contrasting, I say that this is a legitimate way of living and being in the world. And I think this is where I believe I, I, I connect with you know, these feminist theories. And not to mention the fact that I constantly bring in intersectionality. And what I love about Kenshaw is that she says, most studies out there on intersection, inter, inter, intersectionality, we just don't know if they really are, because all they do is to say, this is intersectionality, this is intersectionality, but they don't show it. And that really got me thinking about what truly is intersectionality. So in, in the in, introduction, I mentioned how I believe my framework 
builds this this understanding of intersectionality. But throughout throughout the book, I don't point and say, oh, this is an example of intersectionality. No, because I'm constantly playing with these sources of oppression that plays out because, you know, the they are black women or they they're lower class and living in the favela. So there are all these elements that help us understand oppression in a broader sense. And I think this is what feminist theorists try to do along with the gender aspect, but also to understand that uh, it's it's more complex, right? There are many avenues there. And the chapter five, I bring that a little bit because uh, before that, I'm speaking of favelas as if, and residents of favelas as if they were the oppressed because of that relationship that they have with upper class, with the government, with technology. But then folks in the favelas can also be the oppressor. And that's what I zoom in into the gender issue. And I show how men in the favelas can also be perpetrators of oppression onto women. So I, I and, and I, you know, avoid this general look into the oppression as if it's a broad category. No, it's constantly looking into the nuances of how oppressions play out and how uh, by looking into um, local struggle and agency exercise, we can, I feel like I can connect to uh, feminist theorists in that sense. Well, thank you very much, David. I'm going to try to squeeze in two questions, one mine and another one from John Mitchell from the audience. The first question is um, uh, about this interaction between machine and human. Uh, in the conclusion of your book, you mentioned two examples of technology being used in a liberating way. First was the Elino hashtag and then the Brekidus Apps movement. What do you think is the main difference between both movements, especially related to what they achieved? And then the question by John Mitchell is, um, he says, well, he apologizes, maybe a naive question, but why using the term liberation and not emancipation? Yeah, uh, so I'll start with that uh, because uh, I'm bar borrowing many of the languages and, and jargons even from Paulo Freire, and this is, um, the term that he uses, liberation. And he makes a great case to that. Uh, he also says that liberation, again, is not a state, but rather a, a process that, you know, the oppressed struggles with constantly. So there's no such a thing as this understanding yet as a liberated oppressed, because we're still living in an oppressive society, right? So liberation as a process. Um, oftentimes, these two terms are used inter interchangeably. Uh, they have nuance, uh, nuance differences, but because I'm I'm using Paulo Freire's lingo and and language, then I prefer to use the term liberation. Um, as for the two of uh, the two cases that I bring in in the chapter Technology of Hope, um, they uh, it's quite interesting to see the, the outcomes that came from these two movements. Um, while one, which was the the early now or the the Brazilian version of the Me Too suffered a, a, a huge backlash, uh, especially by women in Brazil, uh, conservative women. The the break of the apps or break the apps uh, didn't. It was actually uh, uh, accepted and really well uh, uh, supported by folks across the board. And. As we know, uh, and I don't have the number, so I don't want to be guessing here, but based on what I saw in the read, most of those food delivery people are men. So then that just leaves the question, and I, I, I mean, the, the conclusion that there must be, and there is uh, an issue about gender, right? Because uh, the Elina was mostly, it was all um, organized and, and promoted by women. Uh, and if we look into the differences of what was it, one was able to accomplish and the other wasn't, then the only the conclusion, possible conclusion that we can think is that one was because of women's movement, then they didn't accomplish as much. And quite the contrary, they suffered a huge backlash, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, uh, as we saw in Bolsonaro's government, although women were constantly put on the, tar you know, at the target of, of, even more oppression, especially with reproductive rights and abortion rights. Um, 
then we saw them get organizing themselves even more, right? I wrote a, an article for Agencia Publica uh, explaining why Bolsonaro and autocrats hate women so much, because women are the one. Women, when women can conquer their rights, that's when we can see democracy prevailing. We often think that because democracy is prevailing, then we see women's right expanding. That's not true. It's women who fight constantly in struggle with their oppressions that finally they find some sort of liberation that then democracy comes and becomes more stable. So that happens, you know, during the, the surrogate movement, the, you know, the voting movement, the Me Too movement. Uh, as I live in the U.S., it's quite uh, possible to see the outcome of the Me Too movement from not only the, the, the movie and in, in, in theater scene, but also, for example, in, in academia and in universities where uh, there's a constant fight to avoid, you know, uh, abuse and harassment onto women in, in those spaces. It still happens, but when you see more of an effort to stop that. Uh, and I think the same thing in Brazil, it helps create this, this consciousness of, you know, women should be where they want to be and they should work with whatever they want to work with. So I think this, these were the two main differences. And, um, for the big of those apps, they were able to pass a couple of policies that guarantee some of the uh, labor rights, right? They were working in terrible, precarious conditions. They were able to move on and work with Congress people to pass some policies the same way that uh, the companies like iFood, uh, Uber Eats, they heard some of the, of the concerns and it's a little better than it was before, far from being ideal but a little better. So there were these incremental changes that uh, we can say it was beneficial, still far away from an ideal um, situation, but yeah, they, they were able to conquer these, these, these um, small, let's say, victories. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, Teang, uh, can you ask the next question, please? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Professor Niemer. I think um, this book was like very fascinating to me because um, I also come from India and then I saw that there were like a lot of parallels. So I just thought maybe um, to ask uh, this question, like how different or related is the uh, situation of favela when looking at it from the marginalization aspect in context to India, like, do you see any resemblance? Uh, so I, I'm not I'm not an expert in India. So maybe you can help me make this parallel. I did live in Bangalore for uh, four months, uh, and even though India is a gigantic country, right? So whatever happens in the south doesn't really mean that you know that's what's happening in the north. I I know that much. Um, but certainly, you know, one thing that I saw the difference, for example, is how unfortunately favelas become a site of the presence of the militias and drug cartels. Um, this is something that I didn't quite see in in the in India. They, you guys call it slums, right? I didn't quite see in the slums of India. So there was, you know, if we are talking about individual uh, safety, then there is that aspect. That differentiate themselves but when it comes to being sites of oppression then especially when it comes to technology right india as we know especially with uh modi he's a huge fan of technology right he thinks technology is the way to save the world and save the country so there's this constant push of promoting technology as the key to salvation or liberation even of folks in 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 the in the uh, in the slums, um, they like to sell the idea that India is is very technological and and, and therefore very progressive. So it's this uh, conceptual mistake of thinking that technological equals pro progressive, which is not true. It actually can be the contrary, which oftentimes happens. Um, and then when you go to the sites, then it's not technological at all. Not that we would like to see, see more technology, but it's just not there. So it's, again, empty promises playing out for them. Because the people there in the, in the slums of Bangalore were really hopeful for, that, for those promises of technology. But we know that these promises never come, but not even the technology came to them so they could even experiment, right? Um, 
but you know it's it's you know people again who's who are into these oppressive systems are trying to power through you know these these sources of oppression trying to find every day to live their everyday lives as they can unfortunately right um India has the, the issue of caste. Social class in Brazil, there are several parallels that we can make uh, about ca the caste system in India. Um, although the social class structure may give us this false understanding that, yeah, people are free to move up and down. Uh, the caste system, not really. But then the ways that oppression happened in Brazil and how things happen in Brazil, then social classes work just as terribly as a caste system that social mobility is not really there. And especially uh, uh, racial mobility in the sense that, you know, black and brown folks in Brazil can be accepted in spaces where, you know, in spaces that were not designed for them. It's not there. So when Brazil's try to brag that now we don't have a caste system, we just have a, a, social, uh, a social class system. Unfortunately, it works just as oppressive as a caste system. It's awful. Um, so yeah, I th I, and again, I'm sorry if I'm if I'm being a little vague. It's just that I don't know enough about the Indian context to make these parallels. But I think you know the the way that you know folks in the slums and the favelas are constantly seen as you know just a a, a voting head for them. So they only become relevant when there's a political campaign. I know that Modi did a push to promote his own phones that came with WhatsApp installed so he could directly send his propaganda to these people, right? So again, that's on the only time when, unfortunately, Islam people become relevant to these to these oppressive governments, right? Um, so I think this is where I see these parallels uh, playing out between these countries. Thank you, David. Uh, Merve, could you ask the next question, please? Well, I have a question that kind of addresses the flip side of Tang's question, maybe like, what do you think is, is unique about the Brazilian favelas, especially in terms of their like, spatial structure? And yeah. how does mundane technology change favela residents' relationship to space and time? Like, what does it mean to go out of the favela to the community technology center and to occupy that space and how does that affect their conception of time and space yeah no thank you that's a great question um so uh, in a very um in a very general and short way to explain favelas uh you know they're usually on hillsides and it has to do with the colonial periods of brazil you know brazil uh, has been used to be a farming country for a long, long time. So for farming, flat lands are the prime lands for that, you know, for, for crops, for cattle. Uh, when the enslaved laborers in Brazil were set free, no reparations were given to them. So they were just given freedom, but nothing else. Uh, hillsides became a, a place that they found refuge, hence, that helps explain a little bit. It's not the only thing, but it helps explain a little bit, you know, the 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 why you know, in favelas there's a predominant black and brown population there. Um, but that has also to do with the long history of oppression of um, of the blacks and browns in in the country. Um, and favelas are usually organized that you know, at the very bottom you have which are more city-like. So you have the shops, the markets, people come down the hill sides to, to buy their stuff. Uh, it's the interface between the city and the favelas. Um, and then at the very middle, if you can say this like this, it's usually where we, we see the residents living. Uh, if we've seen any movies like City of God or, you know, Elite Squad, then the back alleys, you know, the, the wires, they're all like from this, this area. Uh, and then at the very top, for many reasons, usually the, the cartels find their space there because, you know, it's easier to watch the territory from there. Um, but this is just a very uh, mechanic way of describing, but um, favelas, you find in many shapes and forms, you know, in Sao Paulo, they're mostly in, 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 in flat lens uh, than compared to Rio. 
in Victoria, which is interesting because in most countries, uh, the hillsides are, you know, prime lands. Uh, that's where the, the rich live because of their view, because of many aspects. And because of that, some favelas in Brazil, especially in Rio, and I believe that's the Vigigal favela, is basically becoming gentrified because now developers are seeing that as a potential better place to live because of the view or because of many other things. Um, so that, again, favela residents will be displaced and put God knows where because of, of, of these issues. Um, so this is more or less the, the structures of the, the favelas. Uh, what makes them unique? Uh, so many things make them unique. So again, from, from the presence of cartel, for the cartels, and I say this not trying to judge this because it's a complex relationship that the cartels have with the local residents because the state is not there, is not present, then the cartels fulfill some of the roles that was supposed to be delivered by the state, right? But at the same time, there is a, a you know a war on drug and and violence that it, it's terrible for for the for the residents. So I'm not here saying what is good, what is bad, but rather to emphasize the complexity of this relationship that helps shaping the the day to day life in the favelas. Also, their um, connection with Samba schools, it's also part of their identity. In Rio de Janeiro, that becomes very obvious, right? Because of the carnival there, but also in Vitoria, uh, the favelas, the territory of good, where I did my field work, there's also a two Samba schools there for the, for the uh, we call Capixaba or the, um, the carnival of Espírito Santo. That played out a lot on how culture was developed into those spaces. Um, Soccer is a major, as you can imagine, as a major uh, social force in those spaces. You know, every square there's a soccer field that people are constantly uh, playing. Uh, the boteco or the bar is also a, a, a important social space for them to hang out and find information grounds where they often exchange information about their everyday lives, about the conditions of the territory. Um, so all of these little things. Um, help shape uh, favela and many more, right? I can spend days here explaining, you know, how the, the different aspects, it's very cultural, you know, in culture is defined by several um, factors right there. And in terms of the mundane technology, yeah, so they used technology in a very specific ways. Again, they appropriated that technology to make them, uh, the technology theirs. But during the the holiday zine or the little strolls, uh, I, you know, I, I had a very intense exchange with the, uh, famous teenager, so João, I call him João in the book, he created all kinds of digital content so he could be known and famous. So he was a famous teenager and could hang out with his fans and friends at the uh, local square in the favelas. He felt empowered to cross social boundaries and occupy the, a shopping mall, which was a space not designed for them. And then as soon as he got there, you know, he suffered all kinds of racism, classism. Um, he was kicked out of the, the, the place because he was black and, 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 and poor. And this is exactly what he asked me. So he said, the point of being digital included, what's, what's the point? The fact that I'm media literate, like I can create my YouTubes, I can create my memes, I can, I can be famous, you know, because I, I appropriate technology, right? I, I'm part of this information society. But what's the point of doing and being all that, that when I come to a shopping mall, which is supposed to be a, a public space, then I'm treated because I'm treated like this. So is it because I'm poor and black? He made a rhetorical question, but the answer, unfortunately, was yes. Uh, Brazil still hasn't come to peace with their racism. And this shows that technology would not solve these social problems that are rooted in social conditions that are much, much deeper than technology. Now, technology didn't really had no say in how racism and classism were developed in the country. So don't expect them to solve anything if they can do anything to amplify such oppression. Um, so it, it really gave them the idea idea of defining and challenging the, the, 
you know, these boundaries, these legacy boundaries that have been deployed throughout history. But once they challenged that, motivated by their appropriation of technology, they really saw that technology will never be enough to solve the problem. You know, it's rooted in, in, in deeper social issues and factors that technology won't do anything. So again, it gave them this sense of, of empowerment, but they felt how like that empowerment's very, very limited according to space and time, unfortunately. Thank you, David. We are approaching the end of our session. I was just wondering whether I could get in one more question. Is that okay? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah. No, I'm just curious about your informants and uh, if you have follow up on them in the last decade since you did your field work, and especially about the context of misinformation in your work in the last election in Brazil. Yes, uh, thank you for that question, Patrick. Yes, so throughout this project, I've always been in touch with them. In fact, before I even published the book, I sent the final, not the final, but like uh, a draft that was really close to being the final the final draft. Uh, I gave them, I, it was translated to Portuguese and I, I sent it to, to six informants and asked them if they were willing to read it, if there was anything that they would like to be addressed, they like to add, uh, if there was any misrepresentation of themselves, of the territory, you know, if I got anything wrong, it was a really interesting intersection. Overall, they were really happy and how their stories were being told. Um, so I was, you know, quite happy to see this in, in intersection, uh, this in interaction and how they were also excited to be part of, of, of this process. Um, in fact, I'm going back, and, and this question about misinformation is why I'm back in Brazil. This is the next project. I wanna see, how uh, residents in, in, in favelas, they built their own strategies to fight misinformation. Oftentimes, in, especially in Brazil, you know, we love to blame everything on the poor, right? Oh, it's, it's the poor, it's, you know, because they don't have access to education. So it's a very elitist way of thinking, but it's not true. In the book, I actually talk about how they were way more suspicious about information that was misinformation let's say information that were coming to them than those in upper classes because they live in a system that they have to constantly be aware of because nothing is given to them for free you know that would benefit them without any drawbacks so when they start getting all this free information for no reason they were really suspicious because nothing comes for free in their lives uh, so they were always taking things with a grain of salt always, always, and very suspicious and always engaging critically. So in the book, I talk about how like they got a misinformation saying that, uh, you know, communists are evil from, you know, the church group that they belonged. And one wo woman said, well, wasn't Jesus a socialist, a communist? So that doesn't make sense. So that's the critical thinking that they engaged with that we don't see that in, in, in upper classes, right? Now in Brazil, we saw people carrying Bibles and guns and saying that the socialism is evil. So completely lacking this criticality that we saw with them. So it is certainly like, I wish, I mean, I, I could wait a little longer to, to carry out this, this, this research question that you just asked, but this is certainly my next, uh, my next project because I really want to see um, their mundane technologies in fighting misinformation. Because I think that the answer is right there to such a complex problem because they live in these complex systems that they constantly negotiate their, their liberation. And because misinformation is another source of oppression, then they, I believe that they are the ones who will know how to negotiate that and, and deal with misinformation in a more critical way than, than those in upper classes. So it seems to be seen and hopefully I'll be able to come back and report soon. Well, thank you very much for your path-breaking work, David. It's been a pleasure to have you here at Theory from the Margins. And with that, we will conclude our session. Keep uh, posted on our website for our next guest uh, in 2023, starting in February. Thank you, it was a pleasure. Thank you, David. Thank you everyone for joining thank us. You, uh, thank you, David. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.